So I guess it's because I'm not Irish. It's St. Patrick's Day. I had my tie. My wife, Patty Murphy, makes sure that I wear my tie on St. Patrick's Day. But uh, things are not breaking well. So welcome to the first. That's too loud again. No. 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 Is it okay? How about? Okay. That's good. That's good. Uh, welcome to the first of the 2015 uh, Bergeron um, Council on Aging seminars here at the Hudson Council on Aging. Thank you all for coming. Uh, what I had decided to do for this year uh, is I would is that I would take the first two presentations, this one and the next one, and and make both of those really be kind of overview presentations regarding a lot of stuff. And then the two fall ones, I'm going to try to get more specific into some particular issues that folks. Are concerned about so today's, uh, which we are not showing any slides for. It's killing me. I don't think I've done one of these without slides in about five years. So uh, here we go. We, um, what we're going to talk about uh, is Elder Law 101. Uh, really, kind of the basics. Now you have you have um, presentation slides there, and and we're not seeing them here, but I am able to see some of them. Um, and this is about this is Elder Law 101, keeping control as you slow down, which is of course where a lot of us are. So really. The presentation is really about, so you know, you're getting a little older or you're retiring and you're trying to figure out kind of like what you have to do uh, given all of that fact. And, and maybe you're Frank and Mary. You remember I always talk about my friends, Frank and Mary and their friends and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And you know that their goal is to, even though they're retired, to stay in their house. They want to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And then eventually they want to leave things to their kids. Um, and those are their assets. They own a house that they have jointly, and he has an IRA, and they have a joint annuity, and they have a joint bank account. They have total assets of about $625,000, and he's now living, Frank is living on Social Security and a small pension, and Mary is getting Social Security. Uh, his income total is about, is $3,000, is $2,500 a month, and uh, her income, excuse me, his income is $2,000 a month, and her income is seven fifty a month, so they're going to do okay. Uh, but their question is, what do they have to do? So I'm going to talk about before before we get into that slide. I'm going to talk about a couple of other things. No, actually, I'm going to do this slide. So the first question that people ask me when they're talking in this situation is, they don't. Oh, they go. Oh my God, don't I need a will? Well, the answer to that is maybe, right? Because as far as Frank and Mary are concerned, first of all, once again, remember they own their house and their bank accounts and the annuity, things are joint. Uh, and then Frank's IRA is just in his name because it has to be. People are always saying, asking me why the IRAs can't be in both names. Well, just because they can't, because that's the federal government, right? Has to be in one person's name, but you always can name a death beneficiary regarding your IRA or your 401k funds. And as a result, none of those assets will go through probate if Frank dies, or if Mary dies, if, if just one of them dies, because everything is going to just get owned by the other one. So to the extent that you wanted a will for that, well, you don't really need one. Um, if Frank has died and then Mary dies, and their goal is to leave everything to the kids, and you're not concerned about having to go through the probate process, you don't really need a will for that either. Um, because what would happen under current Massachusetts law, this got, the, it used to be that this wasn't the case until about three or four years ago, but under current Massachusetts law, if you die leaving a spouse, uh, uh, excuse me, if you die and your spouse has, and you leave a spouse and children, and there are no like adopted children, it is an unusual family, in that situation, everything goes to the spouse. And if you die and your spouse has died, everything goes to the kids. So your will is that, if that's all it's saying, 
is when I die, things go to my spouse, and, and otherwise things get go to the kids, then you don't need a will. You don't need a will. Um, because if you have a will, whether or not you have a will, if you die leaving any assets that are just in your name, the decision as to who gets them after you die is a decision for the probate court, and therefore it has to go through the probate process. So you're not like saving any money in, in terms of avoiding probate by having a will. That's really in, kind of important to know. Now, there may be some specific reasons why you want a will. Suppose, once again, in this situation, suppose you've got uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Suppose one of these kids has problems. Suppose one of them has a marital problem, and you're not excited about leaving things to basically the in-law that you never liked in the first place. You know that son-in-law or daughter-in-law that you always thought was kind of a creep, and now things aren't working out, you know? Well, you know, you'd hate to have him get a share, or her, because you die and things go to your child, and then that becomes like a, a, an asset in terms of figuring out the divorce. Or if one of your kids has real financial problems, we all, I often have this, find this situation. You've got a child who, for whatever reason, because they were just kind of, you know, the, the artist in the family and kind of never got it together, or because they just went through the recession and things didn't work out for them, you know, and so they've got big debts hanging over them. Well, you don't want to leave things to someone and really you're inadvertently leaving it to their creditors. So in that situation, um, you may want to do something, or if one of your children has a problem, if they have a disability, uh, if you think they may need to qualify for mass health or for other government programs, in all three of those cases, what you may want to be saying regarding your kids is, well, instead of me leaving my share to the child, I think I'm going to leave it in trust for the benefit of that child. I can name one of the other kids as the trustees, right, as long as people get along. Um, so that, that that's not going to just cause friction, or it could name somebody else. So in that way, you're just protecting those assets, right? But unless that's the situation, uh, you don't need a will. I'm just going to mention one other case, which, which if you think you need to take care of this fire, well, then you may want to specify it in the will. And that is, if you die without, if Frank and Mary died, and, and the two of them have died, and they don't um, leave a will, and 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 now that the kids are getting the property. Technically, the kids inherit all the property. They each get one-third of the property, which means, in this case, they each get a third of the house, which means that if the house then next to get, needs to get sold, all three of them have to sign the deed because they're all, they all have one-third of the house. And, and it, it, this can cause real issues, especially if like one of them is living in the house, you know? Or if there's, they're, they're, they have disagreements regarding how much the house is worth, because they all have to sign, right? So in that case, sometimes folks will want to say, well, I want to clarify this through my will. So I'm going to say in my will, upon my death, my, my real estate's going to get sold and the proceeds are going to get divided among the three kids, right? Because now you, you and, and the personal representative, they used to be called the executor of the will, the personal representative can sell the house and can figure out what the price is supposed to be. And then the money gets divided up. And that's nice and easy. Dividing up money is easy, whereas dividing up the house is sometimes more difficult. Okay, so, in, but in general, there may be reasons why you just don't need, really need a will. The things you do need, and we want to talk about these three, are a health care proxy. Uh, you may want to do a MOLST form, M-O-L-S-T. We're going to talk about that for a little while. And you may want to do a power of attorney form. So we're just going to kind of talk about those. First of all, healthcare proxies. Now, do you have a slide that says healthcare proxy? Because I'm looking at this on my screen right now and I didn't see one. Yeah? Okay, it says healthcare proxy. So, about healthcare proxies. Uh, a healthcare proxy does not have to be notarized. It has to be witnessed by two people. Uh, those two people, if, they, they, if they're working in a hospital or a nursing home or other facility, uh, can't or they can they can sign right? But they, so it has to be by two people. Um, it will cover the proxy, and there can only be one at a time. You can't name two people at the same time to be your proxy because the point of the proxy is if your doctor says that you're incapable of making a medical decision, the doctor wants to know they can talk to somebody, one person, and say what do I do? Doesn't help them if you've named two of your kids and they're arguing about it. So. So you always want to name, and by the way, your husband or wife is not your proxy automatically and can't make medical decisions for you automatically. Doctors have traditionally allowed that, but
But, you know, doctors are getting more and more skittish now, so you may want to really kind of specify that person. One other thing, or a couple of other things about proxies. So, so if, you've na if you've named someone as your proxy, in your proxy, and then a doctor determines that you are incapable of making medical decisions, and that's the point at which a proxy kicks in. It doesn't, you're not by writing, by signing a proxy, you're not giving away your power to make medical decisions unless a doctor has said that you are incapacitated. And as soon as the doctor says you're better, then the proxy stops again and then you, you go back into power. But one, one of the contentious issues has been this nursing home issue about whether or not a person with a proxy that the doctor has said is in effect because you're incapable of making decisions can admit you to a nursing home. The answer to that is yes. Now, the, by virtue of having the proxy, that person does not have the ability to actually sign the forms at the nursing home, the admission forms. That's why you need a power of attorney also. Right? There was just a big case on that. right? Um, but they can admit you to the nursing home. However, if you say at that point, I don't want to go, Right? Or if you go to the nursing home and say, I don't want to go. Technically, by doing that, you just revoke your proxy. Right? And you don't have to go. Now, of course, you're, I'm saying that from the perspective of you, the person in the nursing home. How about if it's you, the person taking care of the person that's you're trying to get to the nursing home because they're at home and things aren't going well, you know? Well, I'm just telling you, you should be aware of that. And there is no way around that. If the person whom you think should be at the nursing home says, I don't want to be here, the nursing home may not take them, and you may have to go to court. There is just no way around that. Uh, finally, revocation, revocation of a proxy. Every time you can revoke it by simply, in any time, just not in writing, just by saying, I don't want this proxy anymore. Um, but also, you automatically revoke your proxy every time um, you sign a new one. So if you have a proxy, that you're comfortable with because it contains a lot of the powers that you really want to have in there, like for example, the power of your proxy to talk to your doctor and make sure that he's got all the medical records. You don't want to have a proxy who has the power to make your decisions, but doesn't have the power to talk to the doctor. Remember, if you go to the hospital then, and they give you one of those forms to sign, you know, which they always do when you're going into the hospital, oh, you just got to sign this, this is your proxy. Well, by signing that one, you're revoking the other one, the one that you had already done. So what you should be doing once you have a proxy is give your proxy or a copy of it to your doctor. That's usually the best person, your primary care physician. Then if you go to the hospital, your primary care physician will simply email them or fax them a copy of the, of the proxy. So that's all about proxies. Uh, a couple of other things. <coughs> Spouse or child. So who should be your proxy? Well, you know, I've done thousands of these now, right? And inevitably, uh, when there is a husband and wife, they'll say, oh, we're going to be each other's proxies. And that may be just fine. Um, but ask yourselves, as you're getting older, right, if one of you is really sick and is in the hospital, right, and if you have a child whom you trust, this is assuming that you have one that you, you, maybe you don't, you know, a lot of people don't, you know, but if you do, and that child is probably named right now as your alternate proxy, why don't you make that person the primary proxy? So that if your spouse is in the hospital, you can spend your time being with your spouse. And your son or daughter, who you trust, that's why you were naming him as the alternate, can deal with the doctor, right? And obviously is gonna to talk to you about stuff, but can get, deal with the doctor. So you may really wanna kinda of just think about that. Then, um, to the extent that you are, that you have any particular wishes regarding how you're going to get cared for, um, uh, we, 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 on occasion, we often put some of those wishes right in the proxy, um, but you should know that none of those wishes is enforceable. And what you may want to do, what you may want to do as an alternative to actually having those, that language in the proxy is to actually put it into a separate document, a document in which you're telling your proxy the way in which you would like to be treated. Because no matter what you say in your healthcare proxy, Whatever you pro your proxy says, that's what's going to happen. So you have to really, really trust that proxy. So, and when you're not talking about that, you want to think about some of that stuff. For example, there's often some very standard language that says, well, you know, if I'm going to be in a vegetative state, then I no longer want to have extraordinary measures, you know, regarding my care. 
Well, that leads to two kind of questions. First of all, what is a vegetative state? And two, what are extraordinary measures? You know, do you want to not be intubated? Do you want to not have oxygen put into your lungs in the event that, that, in the event that you're not breathing anymore? What does that mean exactly, right? And, what, and, and th there's often another statement of wishes. The wish is often that says something like, well, uh, I, I don't want to have extraordinary measures if I'm in a condition where I can no longer uh, recognize people, if I can no longer converse. Well, that's all very interesting, but you want to think about, you want to think to yourself, you know, what is the goal of life? You know, suppose you have dementia. I know people who have dementia who can't really recognize anybody. And I'd have a lot of trouble having a long conversation with them. But they're pretty happy. You know, they're pretty happy. Now, some of them are miserable, right? But some of them are pretty happy. The question is, do you want to be telling your proxy ahead of time that if you can't recognize them anymore, that they should no longer want to be keeping you alive because you want to be dead. You want to be dead. So I'm not, I'm not saying what, there's no right or wrong about any of this, but I'm saying these, the healthcare proxy is a really, really, really important document. You want to have those conversations. By the way, in that statement of wishes, you may want to put in some other things like, do you want to have a priest or a minister or a rabbi? Do you want somebody to be called? Are there other things that you want to have happen? That's a great way or a great document to use because it doesn't look legal. It's just a you know written document from you to your the person who's going to be your proxy saying, here's how I really want to be treated. A um, couple of other things. Um, organ donations. Uh, it used to be that in order to make an organ donation, you needed to sign up. Right? You needed to you know, sign one of those things like at the registry and stuff, you know, saying that you wanted to donate tissue or organ or whatever. Um, and then following your death, if you were on this big list, then they, would, then they would contact your next of kin and talk to them about your making a donation. A few years ago, I think because um, they weren't getting enough donations, this law changed. And so now, your donations of body parts are presumed, are presumed. Right? Unless you have said otherwise. So, if, so after you die, it is presumed that, you're, that, you, that it is okay to take some of your body parts. And by the way, folks will often talk to me, like folks in this audience, and they'll say, well, you know, I, what would they want from me? You know, I'm 90 years old, I don't feel really good, right? I, what would they want? Well, mainly, it's, it's about tissue and bone matter. Um, which they can use, which typically they can take from people of all ages and which they can use in operations and stuff. But I guess the reason why I'm, I'm mentioning this is, once again, that it, it is presumed. Um, second, um, under this, um, when they changed the law, they also said that the person who was in charge of your body, not for, gen for purposes of burial, but for purposes of donating body parts, is actually your health care proxy, amazingly. Amazingly enough, then, and if you don't have a proxy, then ne next in order is the person who is your, in your will, your personal representative, uh, or your next of kin. So, probably the best place to put this, if you don't want to donate anything, is in your healthcare proxy. Actually, write into your healthcare proxy that it is your desire that you not donate any, that no body parts be, be donated on your behalf. Okay? Um, the MOLST form. How many people here have seen a MOLST form? Raise your hand. Ah, that's, so the MOLST form, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, M-O-L-S-T, the MOLST form, is the form that is replacing the so-called DNR. Ah, the DNR, or, 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 or I'll, I'll always kind of misnamed the Comfort Care form. I never got why they called it a Comfort Care form, right? It was a Do Not Resuscitate form. It said, if my heart stops, don't do anything to start it, right? Well, the MOLST form, which you should talk to your doctor about, Right? and what your doctor is aware of, for sure, is a more comprehensive form that really talks about a whole set of things, um, of decisions that, that you may want to make ahead of time together with your doctor. The reason why the MOLST form is important is that like the DNR, the MOLST form doesn't just get signed by you, it gets signed by you and your doctor. So, and, 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 as, and if I'm an EMT coming into your house and looking, and, and you're on the floor and I see the MOLST form, I'm most concerned about the doctor's signature, because I can't get in trouble for disobeying you, but I can get in big trouble for disobeying the doctor's order, right? So, so the MOLST form covers the first question, that, that DNR, that basic do not resuscitate question. If my heart 
That, and resuscitation means making your heart start again if it has stopped, right? So it says, and it says in that form, do you want that or not, right? And, and one of the things, and you want to talk to your doctor about that. I know I was recently talking to a, a wonderful doctor um, named Ricard, Dr. Ricard, a wonderful geriatrician who practices around here who said, she'd given me a statistic, I want to say it's that if you are over 70 years old uh, and you are resuscitated, your chances of living another 30 days are like 5%. Or 10%. It's incredibly small. And, and, and you kind of want to weigh that against the fact that this resuscitation process is really painful. Really painful. They are pushing through your ribs and often breaking them in order to try to push down on your heart in order to make your heart get going again. That's not a good time. Right? So, so you want to think about that. You also want to think about some other stuff that is on the most form. I'm just going to mention two. Intubation. I referred to that earlier. Intubation means if you have stopped breathing, that a tube gets stuck down your throat and into your lungs so that air can be pushed into your lungs to see if they can get your lungs going again, right? Not a pleasant experience, so you want to decide whether that's something that you really want to have done, right? And you want to do it now. I mean, when, you know, when you're relatively healthy, you want to be thinking about this. The third, and, and I think this is a really important one, is do not hospitalize. I think more than anything, for people who are thinking through these issues and are, uh, they, they will say to me, you know, I want to get to the point, if I want, I want to die naturally. That's often the line, I want to die naturally, right? Um, what that means is you don't want to go to the hospital, right? Because if you go to the hospital, you are, they are going to save you. I mean, if they possibly can, they are going to save you. Why? Because, a for a couple of reasons. One, because that's what doctors do, you know? Doctors went to school to cause people to keep living, not to let them die. And doctors, there's just a tendency, that's where they want to go. The second reason is the hospital. I remember, for, I was on the Marlboro Hospital Board here for a number of years, um, and I remember, you know, when someone dies in our hospital, that's a big deal. You know, and if a number of people die, that's, you know, we've got to report this to the Department of Public Health, and now you get investigated, and oh my God, this is terrible. So we want to get you out the door. We want to get you home. So if you want to die naturally, you may want to be thinking to yourself, I don't want to go to that hospital at the end, at the end, or at least you, want to, you may want to fill in the most form to say that. Now, having said all of those things, um, the, 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 um, Healthcare proxy, the proxy that you name, can always overrule any of that, right? So if they contact, you're on the floor, they contact the, the, uh, the uh, proxy, they can overrule everything that I just said. One other thing, by the way, about the, the most form, keep it on your refrigerator. Uh, I actually recently interviewed um, the person who runs Patriot Ambulance and his chief of, staff, uh, chief of operations. And they said that's what they train their people to do. When they go into the house, they look to the refrigerator. Right, I mean, this is an emergency. They're going in the house, and you're not doing anything, you know, and they gotta make some decisions quick. So they're gonna look for the refrigerator. If there's no MOLST or DNR form there, they're gonna stop looking, probably, right? So if you are interested in this, keep it on the refrigerator. Um, now, the reason why you wanna do all of this stuff is the alternative is guardianship. And guardianship it can be really, really terrible, and it can cost a lot of money, and it's very public. I inevitably find myself doing a couple of these every year and it's, it's about $10,000 now to go through a straightforward guardianship in the probate court. Uh, and you can avoid all of it with the power of, with, with the healthcare proxy. Powers of attorney. Powers of attorney. Very briefly, um, does a power of attorney have to be notarized? No. Does it have to be witnessed? No. The only time it has to be notarized, is one exception, is if the person that you're giving the power to, if you want to give them the ability to sign a deed or other document affecting your real estate. Otherwise, they don't have to be notarized. Should they be? Yes. The reason for that, you've heard me use this line before. My daughter once gave me a t-shirt said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now the point in a, in a, in a power of attorney is that the judge is not a judge. You, you're never gonna bring a power of attorney to a judge. It's the guy at the bank that you wanna be able to sign somebody's checks for him, you know, or the guy at the insurance company because you wanna close out the account. It's just like plain old folks. You give them, you need to make this document look official. <laughs> and, and, and having a notarization makes it look more official, right? And so they, most people buy it, they buy a notarization. 
Um, the only time you want to be thinking about witnesses is if you own real estate out of state, if you own property out of state. Massachusetts does not require witnesses, but some other states do. Um, in the power of attorney, what should be in there? Well, if you want to allow your attorney to sell your real estate or transfer it, you, you need to specify that in the power of attorney. If you want to allow your attorney to self-deal, right, to make gifts to himself or herself, or to do any transactions with himself or herself, that needs to be specified. If you're naming, a lot of times people will name, in, in a power of attorney, you can name more than one person. You can name people jointly, and you can name two people. You can name five people. You can also name them jointly and severally. So in this Frank and Mary case, where one of the other kids, maybe Mary Jr., who lives around here, the designated daughter, if she's really the one that's kind of helping out, then each parent may want to name their spouse and Mary and one of the kids jointly and severally. That way, if there's an issue and something needs to get signed, either your spouse can sign, or if your spouse is disabled, or is in the hospital and doesn't want to be you know, with you and doesn't want to have to go to the bank, you know, that way someone else can do it. So you can name people jointly and severally. Those documents, healthcare proxy, most power of attorney, are the most important documents that you can be doing. The reason for the power of attorney, you avoid a conservatorship. If you are incapacitated and no one has a power of attorney from you and someone needs to go to the bank for you, sign any documents, they need to go to the probate court and get a conservatorship approved. And that causes fighting. And it's, and it's very expensive and it's very time consuming, right? So it's very, very easy to avoid all that. So if I'm Frank and Mary, those are the, um, those are the documents I want to think about. Inevitably, Frank and Mary are, going to, are talking to me though also. They're getting worried. They're like, oh, what if we go to a nursing home? What do I do? So I'm going to go very briefly over Mass Health 101, because that's really a part of Elder Law 101. If you are Frank and Mary and you have those assets and that income, and Mary needs nursing home care, remember, Mary can qualify for, if Mary will be covered by Medicare for no more than 100 days, but she can qualify for Mass Health immediately. All that she has to do is shift all of her assets to Frank. Because while Mary can't have more than $2,000 in countable assets, Frank can have, and by the way, this number changed from, it goes up a little bit with inflation, $119,220 in cash or cash equivalents. He can own the house, as long as the house is worth less than $814,000. So he can own just about every house, you know, it's a lot of houses. Um, and he can have unlimited income. So you can simply shift everything to Frank and then Mary can immediately qualify for Mass Health. So what that means is, if Mary needs to qualify, we just, we're gonna shift everything. The only other thing I wanna mention is, if suppose, I mean, because in Frank and Mary's case, they have more than $119,220. What do they do then? It's the one and only case in which I suggest that people buy annuities. In that case, we would shift everything to Frank. Frank would go buy an annuity, as long as the annuity calls for monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his life expectancy, then the purchase of that annuity is a legitimate spend down of money. So he can take all of his money that's above this magic number, go buy an annuity with it, which is gonna give him a monthly income check, big monthly income check. And by doing that, get his assets down below that $119,000 uh, figure, and the next day, Mary can qualify for Mass Health. So, the immediate thing that I always tell people, and I know there are a few people here that I know, and then I've told it to them, is that inevitably people are surprised by this because they've heard that the only thing they can do is give away all their assets and wait five years, and that's not true. They can keep control of their assets. The only other thing that Frank may want to do, Frank and Mary, is remember, currently all of their assets are held jointly, and Frank has said that when he dies, all of his assets are gonna go to, his IRA is gonna go to Mary. So if he dies and then Mary needs nursing home care, well now she has a problem because she can't have more than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank could protect against that by simply having a will, and in this case he would need a will. Having a will which says that when he dies, everything is gonna be left in trust for Mary's benefit. He can name one or more of his children as the trustees. He can give them all the discretion to distribute any or all of those assets to Mary at any time. Which she can, which she can take. He, they can, if if she, Frank dies and Mary, who is still in good shape, says, "Hey, kid, I really want to have a hundred thousand dollars." They can just write her a check. Here's a hundred thousand dollars. Now, 
Once she has that $100,000, if she needs to qualify for mass health, that money's gonna have to get spent down. But everything left in trust, the house, all the rest of the cash, that's still gonna be safe, right? So there's a, there's a clear, there's an available plan that they have to do ahead of time. The only other thing they need to do ahead of time is have a power of attorney. They need to have a power of attorney so that if either of them is incapacitated and we need to be shifting some of these assets around, we can do it on their behalf because somebody can sign on their behalf. So because if you're thinking about this kind of protection and you're married, this is the obvious course. What if Frank has died and Mary hasn't done anything? Well, in that case, and that's Mary's assets. You've already seen those assets. Um, she can do a few things, but no matter what she does to try to protect anything, it's gonna take five years before it gets protected. She can transfer the house. She can give the house either to her children uh, or to an irrevocable trust. That's the place where you hear irrevocable trusts come up. She can keep a life estate in that house, that is the control over that house for the rest of her life so that she's gonna, she knows she's gonna be safe as long as she's alive. Five years after she does that transfer, uh, of, the, of that interest in the house, the house is going to be safe as far as mass health is concerned. She may want to deed that property to an irrevocable trust instead of to the three kids if she thinks she's going to sell that house, if she may want to sell that house during her lifetime. Otherwise, when she goes to sell the house, she may be paying some capital gains tax. As to other assets, the other cash, the other money that we were talking about here, the the the, the it's really, if she really wants to protect these things, it's really a two-step process. First, she needs to give them away. Give them away to the kids, to somebody, to me. She can give them to me. No, but she can give them to the kids, right? And then, if the children create a trust, because they want to make sure that the money is going to be in one place if Mary needs it, right? And name themselves as the beneficiaries of that trust. Then, later on, if Mary needs the money, then they could distribute that money to themselves and then make gifts back to their mother. Alternatively, they could do none of that. They could just keep the money in a separate account, right? Knowing that if their mother needs the money, they can give it back to them. Now, to do that kind of strategy, that's scary, right? Because to do that, you have to be losing control of the money. Right? You have to be giving it away and hoping that it's gonna be okay later on to come back. And that's why most people don't do that. Many people, though, will do the house transfer because they feel that by doing the house transfer, they're not losing anything. They're still able to live in the house for the rest of their lives. They still feel safe, so they feel comfortable about that. Uh, in general, in general, when you, you, you don't do a transfer now that simply goes to an irrevocable trust of any of these casher, casher things. You want to transfer things to your kids, have them set up something. There have been a number of challenges recently to irrevocable trusts there are a lot of these things that we're, we're concerned are not, are, going to, are not going to be considered to be safe havens for your money. So you want to be doing this a different way. Um, the home, we talked about the home. A uh, couple of things. If you are transferring the house to your child with a and keeping a life estate, that's much cheaper than transferring it to an irrevocable trust. The problem with it, as I mentioned to you, is that if you folks go to sell your house today that you've owned and you bought it and you're in Hudson and you've been living there for 50 years, that, that property has gained a lot of value. You know that if there are two of you are both alive, that if you sell that house, you, you, there's going to be, a, there, may, there would have normally been a capital gains tax owed on the capital gain. That's the difference between what you sell it for and what you bought it for. Uh, if, on the other hand, you keep a life estate in the property, give this other interest to your kids, and then you die, that so-called basis in the property, that what you bought it for, jumps to the date of death value so they won't pay a tax. When, while you're alive, if you sell your house, you get a, a $500,000 capital gains exemption. The problem, if you transfer your, an interest in your house to your kids but keep a life estate and then go to want to sell it, is that the capital gains exemption only applies to a piece of the value, the piece that's attributable to the life estate. So you may end up having to pay a capital gains tax. That's the other reason I just wanted to kind of mention it. If you're using the gift to the irrevocable trust, you probably, that's probably not going to be the case. Finally, uh, a little bit about long-term care insurance. At, when you're Frank and Mary and you're at these ages and you're like 65 and you're just kind of getting older and stuff, long-term care insurance is still an option. 
You may still be able to get it, but the question is, do you want to get it? Well, to the extent that you are getting long-term care insurance because you want to make sure that you are, um, uh, if you need to go to a nursing home, that the nursing home costs are going to get covered. Oh, uh, did I tell you all to shut off your phones before we, before we did this today? Sorry about that. Uh, um, to the extent that you are, that that's the reason why you're doing it. First, the long-term care insurance policy is going to cost you a bundle of money um, because the monthly the monthly cost of nursing home care is so high, twelve thousand dollars a month. Um, so that so what they, what you're insuring against is the possibility of this insurance company having to pay maybe one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year for a number of years. So the premium cost is really going to be high. Now you don't have to do it. You don't need the long-term care insurance if you're both still alive and you've structured your wills correctly. Because as I mentioned, if you're both still alive for nursing home purposes, if one of you needs to go to the nursing home, the other one can simply, you can simply transfer all the assets to the other one and you're gonna be safe. If one of you has died and, you, and just the other one is alive, you may wanna consider the long-term care insurance. Finally though, you may wanna consider it because of the frail elder waiver. You have a slide on this in the frail elder waiver? Yeah. So, once again, I'm just, I'm just looking through these. Um, the frail elder waiver, if you are medically eligible for nursing home care, um, then you are, under Ma as far as Massachusetts is concerned, then you are also eligible. If, and if you are eligible for, you may be eligible for Mass Health to cover that nursing home care, but if you're medically eligible for nursing home care, then for mass health purposes, you're also eligible for a program called the Frail Elder Waiver. Through that program, which I've talked about here before, mass health will pay um, all, all of the, the, for all of the hours of home care that the aging services access point for this area, which is called Bay Path Elder Services, says that you need in order to stay at home. They'll pay for all of those hours. All you have to do is be financially eligible. Now. There's, a, there's two steps to being financially eligible. First, you have to have less than $2,000 in countable assets, right? But in this case, your spouse, if your spouse is still alive, can have unlimited assets. So you can qualify for the frail elder waiver no matter how much you have in assets by simply shifting everything to your spouse and then qualifying. The issue though is there is also an income restriction. And that income restriction is you have to earn less than $2,199 per month. Now your spouse's income is not counted in this, but your income, it's, and it's gross, it's gross. It's, you know, it's all of your Medicare check before we subtract for the deductible for you know, the, the, the $104 or whatever, it's all of, all of it, it's gross, before taxes. Now, for many folks today, they exceed that number. And if you exceed that number, the $2,199 per month, you have to pay a big, big deductible in order to qualify for the frail elder waiver. So in that situation, if you are saying to yourself down the road, you really, really, really want to stay at home, no matter what, you really want to stay at home. And if it turns out that your income, and you can figure out pretty much now, the income, that whether your income is going to disqualify you from this program then you may want to buy long-term care insurance because the long-term care insurance will cover you no matter what they say at Mass Health about frail elder waiver. That's, um, that's kind, of a, the, kind of the major reason. The second reason, though, is that if you qualify for the frail elder waiver, the home care folks that you are being sent to you are only the, the, the people who are vendors to Mass Health, and Mass Health's rate is lower than the private pay rate, right? And so you may find that it limits your options to be going through the frail elder waiver and therefore qualifying. So you're, you're not, you, so, you, so you may want to think about long-term care insurance just because of that flexibility. So ironically, what you thought you were buying that policy for, which was to cover your nursing home care, is not nearly as important is as the parts of the policy that talk about this availability of home care. If you're looking at those policies though, you want to read the fine print. You want to look at some of these issues. You want to know when they say you're sick enough to get this care. Under many of these policies, you, you, the, the level of, of care that you need 
is lower than what you would need uh, in order to qualify for the Frail Elder Waiver. So you really want to look at that. How many activities of daily living do you need to have, to have help with, right? How sick do you have to be? That's for a second. Who can do this job for you? Um, do the people coming into your house have to be from a certified agency? Sometimes they have their own lists of certified agencies. Or could it be somebody that you feel is competent? Does that person, if you feel they're competent, have to be certified in some way as a certified nurse assistant or something through the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? You want to look at that, right? And you want to find out from the long term, from that, through that policy, whether if the policy won't pay the person you want to hire enough money, do you have the ability to top it up, right? To pay the extra, the gap between what long-term care insurance would pay and what that person is going to charge. These are the kinds of questions that you want to look at when you're looking at a long-term care insurance policy. Once again, you, you, in most cases, the long-term care insurance policy is not going to keep you from being able to save your assets from being depleted if you're in a nursing home. What will keep you from doing that is some of the other things that I talked about, because the nursing homes are just so expensive. What long-term care insurance policy may very well do for you, though, is help you to stay at home, where you might not have otherwise been able to stay at home. And so, so many times that's the issue, that folks literally get into that position that they can't afford to stay at home. And that's where the long-term care insurance policy can really help you. Uh, a couple of other things that you worry about as you're getting older, one of them is estate tax avoidance. This is a snapshot. If you have total assets between you and your spouse of less than a million dollars, you have no estate tax issue, right? And that's a lot of people, right? That's a lot of people. So, you know, don't even think about it. You don't have to worry about it. And I'll just mention also, while I'm here, as far as gifting is concerned, there is this myth that you cannot give someone, like one of your kids, in a particular year, more than a particular amount of money, like it used to be $10,000 and now it's $14,000. That is incorrect. That is incorrect. Where that number comes from is that there is, there is no Massachusetts gift tax. There is a federal combined estate and gift tax. And the way the system works is that when you die, you're allowed to give away a lot of money, over $5 million now. And if you die and you have a spouse, and you haven't used your $5 million, then your spouse gets it, so they get to give away $10 million when they die. Except, except that if you have made big gifts during your lifetime, and they define big as more than that magic amount, more than 14, in this year, $14,000. If you've given more than $14,000, or if you're a husband and wife and you've given more than $28,000 to one person in this year, then the excess has to get subtracted from the 10 million. So that now, if you're giving away, instead of giving $14,000, you gave somebody $24,000 this year. Then instead of being able to, at death, give away 10 million, you can only give away $9,990,000, right? That's the only consequence, right, of this, this gift. So you can give away as much as you want any time you want. I just wanted to kind of mention that. Now, if you are over a million dollars, and, you know, it always amazes me how many people are, right? But a lot of times it's because it's real estates and IRAs and 401Ks. And a lot of people were under four years ago but are over now because the market came back, you know, or the real estate's back. If you are over, you need to understand that the initial tax rate on your money over a million dollars is 40%. 40%. Now, it goes down after the first $100,000 over a million. But on, if you have an estate of a million one, you're going to pay a tax of $40,000. It's 40% of that extra $100,000. The reason why I mention that is, you can, it's, it's, if you're married and you're both still alive, it's fairly easy to avoid that. But that's something you have to talk to a lawyer about. You can structure things so that the government, when the first of you dies, considers a piece of that money to have been given directly to your kids. And then when the second of the two of you dies, then the rest goes to your kids. And since the, the, each, each estate individually is less than a million dollars, you can keep this number below the magic number and avoid the estate tax entirely. So I'm just mentioning that to you. One, if you've got less than a million, don't even think about it. If you've got more, though, there is this big potential tax which you can avoid fairly easily, right? Uh, avoiding probate. Now, we just talked about probate. And as I mentioned, you do not avoid probate by having a will. Right? 
Because whether you have a will or don't have a will, if you own anything individually, just in your name at the time you die, it's going to have to go through the probate process, which can be expensive. Not as expensive as it used to be, but it's about uh, five to $7,000 to get through the probate process. Right? It's not nothing. Right? Now, typical ways to avoid it. One, like Frank and Mary have done, is to own everything jointly. So that if one dies, because legally, if you own something jointly with someone else, when one of you, each of you owns 100% of the item. So when one person dies, that person's, that person's interest simply evaporates, and the other person owns all 100% of the item. So none of those items have to go through probate. Things like uh, IRAs and 401ks and annuities, typically annuities, anything that has a, a, a so-called transfer on death beneficiary, don't go through probate. So you can often avoid going through probate. The most common item that throws you into probate is your house. If you own the house jointly, one of you dies, the other one becomes the sole owner. When that person dies, it has to go through probate. The most simple way to avoid that, uh, if you are uncomfortable about putting other people's names on the house with you as joint owners, um, is to set up a revocable trust, a revocable and amendable trust. You name yourself as the trustee. If there are two of you are both alive, you name the two of you as trustees. You say, when one of us dies, the other one is the trustee. You keep complete control over the property as long as you're alive. But you say that following the death of the second of the two of you to die, you're going to name one of your kids, Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr., for example, as the successor trustee. That person, upon your death, can simply step into your shoes, go sell the property. Property never goes through probate. So it's kind of, that's the most common thing. Often, or, one, or a couple of other items, uh, trucks, cars. If one of you dies and you own your car individually and your spouse is alive, there's a special Massachusetts statute that says that presumptively the spouse was the joint owner of the car. So the spouse can simply go to the registry with a death certificate and they'll transfer the car into the spouse's name. No, not true, of course, with kids, right? So if you die without leaving a spouse, that asset is going to have to go through probate unless it is owned jointly with somebody jointly with somebody. So if you're really concerned about avoiding probate, and that's usually a pretty big asset, you may want to name one of your kids, for example, as a joint owner on the car. Right? That's just a possibility. Finally, personal property. What about personal property? How does that get dealt with when you die? Well, the answer is, it just gets dealt with. Right? All the kids get together and they divide up the personal property. And every once in a great while, there's a fight about that. Right? And if there is a fight about that, then those people have to go to the probate court. But that is really, really rare that that happens. To the extent that you are concerned about that, however, my suggestion would be, in that, if, if you're really worried that they're going to fight, if you've got a stuff that's in the house that you think is, you know, has got real value, or if you've got a bunch of cars that are still in your name, and they're going to, a lot of times that's the thing that's really a lot of value, then, you, then you may want, then in that case you may want to have a will. You may want to have a will that says in the will. You don't even have to list all this stuff in the will. It just says in the will, um, I, if I have li li left a list specifying how my property is going to get distributed at the time of my death, everybody has to follow it. And if there's no list, everybody has to divide up the property as they agree, but if they can't agree, then the executive, this personal representative, used to be called the executor, is going to decide. Now you put that in the will, right? And then you die, and then there's this personal property, and people think they're going to fight about it. Right? So now, the person who has the will says, oh no, but the rules are right here. So we got two possibilities. We can either follow the rules that are in the will, right, without going to probate, or we can spend $7,000 and then follow the rules that are in the will by going to probate, right? So the effect of the will is to keep them from going to probate, because it convinces everybody that no one's going to benefit by going to probate. See how that works? Right? So I, once again, it, it's one of those little things that's on people's minds. If you're, if you're worried about it, you know, the, the goal of all of this stuff is to not lose sleep at night. So, if you're doing a will, the two things that you may want to have, well, I talked to you about a couple of things that you may want to have in the will, right? You want to deal with this trust issue if you've got a child that you've got a concern about, right? You may want to deal with the house saying it's going to get sold. A couple of other things. The biggest source of probate fighting, what I call family feuds, is the fight between the personal representative under the will who says, oh, that asset should be in the estate, 
and the surviving joint owner of a bank account, or a house, especially a house, but of a bank account, who says, hey, mom put that bank account in my name with us jointly, right? She wanted me to have it. So, well, and this, is a, this happens a lot. This happens a lot, right? And we've talked about this a little bit before. I mean, and it may or may not be that Mom really wanted her to have it. I've had cases where Mom clearly did want that daughter or son to have that account. And other cases where she really didn't, right? She really, it was just that that was the child that was kind of taking care of things so that everything was put jointly in that child's name, right? Or there were cases where I had no idea, right, what her intention was or his intention was. So the easiest way to resolve that, once again, is with this kind of, of, kind of the, the will. And you say in your will, right in the will, it is my intention, for example, that all accounts that are held by me jointly with someone at the time of my death are, are supposed to be going to the, the joint owner. You don't even have to name the accounts. You just say all accounts. I mean, if you're, if you're concerned about privacy and blah, 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 right? But you just want to cover it, right? Or you may want to say, all of my accounts don't go to that person. They're all supposed to go into my estate. That's my intention, right? So that you straighten it out. Now, once again, if that kind of clause is in the will, you may find that it resolves, is that you won't, you're going to be dead, but th your kids will find that, they, that they're never going to have to go to probate because everyone's going to know what happens if they go to probate, right? That is the surviving joint, so, so that suppose Ma dies and there's one account, it's got $100,000, and, 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 and Mary dies, and the, the surviving joint owner was Mary Jr., because she was the one that was around. And, and, and Peter and Paul are writing, saying, but wait a minute, Ma wanted us each to have a third of that, right? And Mary says, oh no, I was taking care of Ma, I was supposed to get all of it. Well, if you did a will, it's going to straighten it out, one way or the other, right? If it says Mary keeps it all, well then Mary keeps it all. If it says Mary has to distribute it, then Mary has two choices. She can either distribute it, right, or they can probate the will and force her to distribute it, and then she distributes it. So of course now they're going to not go through probate and they'll distribute the money, right? So just a couple of ideas. Uh, finally, as, as, as I always say, but it's really, really important in this presentation, the goal of this type is to sleep well, stuff is to sleep well at night, right? None of these things are of concern that you don't have to deal with them. If they are of concern though, if you're worried about, especially if you're worried about these, the thing stuff at the end, the, the kids fighting, you know, you owe it to yourself. Go talk to somebody. Try to get this stuff straightened out. Thank you very much. Any questions? I'm actually running good on time. Uh, let's go there, 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 and there. Yes, sir. Two related questions. A surviving spouse mm -hmm. without a will, several assets are in joint accounts. Mm -hmm. Do the joint owners of those accounts get them? The question, the question is, you've got, so, so you've got a, you've got a, I'm going to say a husband and wife, and the husband died. I'm just making this up. And the husband died, and there is, a, and there is a will, and there's no will, but there is a surviving spouse, but there is that there are bank accounts. The surviving spouse is, is remains, and then passes away. Ah. Oh, okay. So, the, so that's a, that's. A, oh, I thought this was a more fun one. Okay. So, there's a <laughs> husband dies, joint accounts with the wife. Wife, he, he, wife then dies. What happens to those accounts? Well, they're just in her name, which means they're going to have to go through probate, unless she has named. If they're in joint accounts. A, a, unless she has named a joint owner, another joint owner, one of the kids. That's why oftentimes that so will happen. Frank will die, and Mary will will now put her kids' names on the accounts. I thought you were going to tell me that. Frank died, and, and there was a, and there were joint and there was no will, and the surviving spouse was supposed to get everything, but he had named a couple. He had named the bimbo from Florida on there. No, no bimbo. Just a joint account, and that's a more interesting. And that that's the one where he should have said something in the will. And, and he should have owned up. Yeah, what was the other question? The second question is: Is there a difference in the eyes of the law between a natural child and an adopted child, as far as? None. There is no difference in the eyes of the law between a natural and adopted child. Remember, stepchildren are not adopted children. Even if they're step, you think of them as stepchildren, you gotta adopt them in order for them to have any legal rights. Next question was over here. I'm sorry, yes? Where do you get a most? The most one, talk to your doctor. Yeah, you can also find them online, but your doctor's gonna have them. Write or stop at the hospital. And it's really, they're a very useful, it's a very useful exercise to go through it, and go through it with one of your kids. You know, just kind of help think out those issues. 
Other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry that I can't hear you. I'm, I'm getting deaf, so you have to be really quiet. If you've had a long-term care insurance policy for a long time, but you've gotten to this age and you're still paying premiums, I didn't hear about that part, and you're still paying premiums, well, then I, you want to make this decision. You know, you want to decide if, 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 there is a, if, it's, if it's you and a spouse, right? If you're single, it's one thing. If it's, you, if it's you and a spouse, well, then you can avoid ever having to pay for nursing home care so long-term care doesn't do anything for you. If you're single, um, then, you know, you're trying, you're trying to sleep well at night. You're trying to balance that off. You know, it may be that you, know, you, you need to figure out what the long-term care insurance is going to pay versus what the nursing home cost is going to be. Once again, a good nursing home here is $400 a day. How much is your policy for? Right? It may be that it's an irrelevance. I mean, what's the point of the fact that it covers you know, a small piece if you're still going to get wiped out by, you know, because of the nursing home cost? Right? But then you really want to look at, as I mentioned, the home care piece. Right? To the extent that it gives you that, that may be something, especially if you would otherwise have to pay a big deductible because you can't qualify for mass health because your income is too high. So you, a lot of things to weigh. I can't give you a specific one, but you want to look at it because you're paying a premium, right? And they're not small. Other questions? Yes, sir. In the case where your slide shows that Mary went into a nursing home, assets were transferred to and a lot of the came below the number 19,000 that you need to buy an annuity. Is it the annuity has something less than the annuity. The, the the question was, as I as I explained, that when when if if Mary needed to go into a nursing home, all assets can be transferred to Frank. Frank needs to get his Frank, Frank can get his assets below that hundred nineteen thousand two hundred twenty dollar figure by buying an annuity. The annuity has to be for a term shorter than his actuarial life expectancy. Now remember, if you are eighty five, your actuarial life expectancy is mm, six years, seven years. Right? If you're 100, your actuarial life expectancy is actually two years, right? Just by virtue of you're still standing, right? So the, the term has to be shorter than that period. Now, the, uh, many annuity companies won't sell annuities now for a term of shorter than five years, but some will. I mean, there's a, there's a market there, right? You may have to pay a premium in order to get that annuity. You never buy these annuities because you're going to make money. And you're not make, you're doing this as a great investment versus something else. It's because you're qualifying for mass health. That's the reason why you do it. Any other questions? Mm, yes, ma'am. And, and by the way, I know I started a few minutes late, so I'm going to start this. I'm going to make this my last question. I'm happy to answer other questions after I'm done. Yes, ma'am. If you own a car, that you should put that car in somebody else's name. I don't do that. The question was, if you own a car, you should put it in somebody else's name. Uh, you can. Yours in somebody else's. Yes. If you if you have the title to the car because right. the, you know there's no loan on it, then you can just whoop, you can just go to the registry. I mean, you can you can. You can transfer the car to yourself and that other person jointly with rights of survivorship. And that way, if you die, he or she becomes the sole owner of the car. Otherwise, that car has to go through probate. It's not an expensive probate as long as the rest of your assets are less than $25,000, but it's still a process. You know, it's $1,000. It's going to cost you something. You can avoid that by structuring it that way. Why can't it be personal property? The question is, why can't it be personal property? The exception to my general rule, don't worry about it, with personal property, is if there's a title to it. The problem is the title to this. Right? Same thing, by the way, with boats. Boats, planes, big stuff. Right? For that, you need to get a, joint, a surviving joint owner. I think that was the last question. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in a couple months.